Revelation chapter 17, the book of Revelation chapter 17. Thank you for being faithful to the house of God. Amen. Revelation chapter 10, 17, pardon me, beginning at verse number 10, 17 verse 10. The Bible says, and there were, are seven kings, five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet to come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall have their power and strength unto the beast. And these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Jesus, we love you tonight. We are so thankful to be able to gather together. I ask you to open our ears to hear. Help us, God, to impart in our lives this message, this thought tonight. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus name everybody said amen. amen God bless you may be seated tonight for the next short while I want to preach to you and share with you a message titled the reward the reward the reward so use your imagination for a moment and visualize I guess if you could this scene the beast and his kings in the book of Revelation 17 which have risen up to make war with the Lamb, and as they rose up in offense against the Lamb, well, here comes Jesus and his saints in defense. Remember the story about Elijah, Elisha, I should say, and his servant, and they were, the city was compassed about, and he goes back, alas, my master, what are we going to do? We, we're dead, we're in trouble. And he said, open his eyes, because there's more with us than they are with them if you just picture tonight jesus shows up and he says okay you're coming after me all right let's take him out and here comes jesus and all the saints in defense now what would that moment be like to me it would be like they're fighting a losing battle a battle in which they would have no hope of winning there's no chance you have no opportunity their weapons would be powerless I remember the time when Jesus went before Pilate and he says, you don't take my life, I give it. If I want, I can call legions of angels and just make you, he didn't say this, but pretty much make you a greasy spot and you would all be done. It would just be amazing to see. But in the book of Revelation chapter 19, if you'd like to turn there, chapter 19, the book of Revelation, you'll find that John the Revelator, he describes such a moment like this revelation chapter 19 beginning at verse number 11 and he writes and i saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had the name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture drip dipped, pardon me, in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, with, with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, could you imagine that moment, the final victory over the beast and his armies? Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, riding, and there you are, church. There we are, riding with him. Could you imagine that battle? It would be like going into victory, and, and uh, there's this little story, of course, it's way off the, the, the direction of this, but about this guy who was having trouble with these kids in school, and so he threatened them, 
you know, him and his buddies were going to come and just beat the wax out of him. And I guess they were in an early elementary grade, and the other kids were in uh, young high school, you know, probably grade eight or nine. And, and he said, we're going to meet you after school, and we're going to beat the wax out of you, and finally you're going to quit bowing all the kids. And so he took about three or four of his friends, and they walked out onto the field. And as they're walking on the field, they look, and here comes here comes a whole bunch of these people. They got like 15 kids from high school with bats and chains. And, and so he walks up there, and unbeknown to him, <laughs> his buddies took it the other way. And, and he stands there and goes, today you're going to get defeated, and today we're going to take you out. And he said, we? What do you mean, we? And he turns to find that his friends had already run for the hills, and he stands there, and he looks, and he's standing alone. I think that's just like the devil. What do you mean, we? You're going to take me out. What do you mean, we? And you're going to win this battle. I've got thousands upon thousands, and I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and this is your final battle, and you will not win. So this is the reward for being called chosen and faithful. See, as Christians, we tend to talk more about the sacrifice than the reward. But there is a reward for the sacrifices we make. See, as God sees you getting up that extra hour to pray, as God sees you as you bite your tongue and you hold back the angry words that you were itching to say, God was he who's seen you say no to that drink, to that drug, and, and no to those temptations or that temptation that you faced. Over the years, it was God who saw you coming faithfully to church and staying connected as I preached last Sunday. What I'm saying to you tonight, church, is God does see. And it is God who remembers and who takes an account of our lives. How do you know that? Well, the Bible says that he knows the very numbers of the hairs upon our head. And some of us, you just have to count the molecules and the follicles. But for most of us here with, with hair, he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. He knows your prayers before you pray them, your thoughts before you think them. See, God sees the elderly who have given their lives for the gospel. And God sees the middle-aged and the young person who denies the temptations and the fleshly lusts of their generation to serve him. But there are rewards for serving God. Sometimes rewards arrive right away. But as blessings of God are bestowed upon us, and you, the Bible says daily, he loadeth us with benefits. Sometimes they're right there. They're just... On the spot, they just happen. You go, well, thank you very, very much. But more often, they are rewards that are laid up for us in heaven. In a familiar parable of the servants who were given talents to use for their Lord, pardon me, in, the, in this parable, we hear the phrase repeated, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And we also hear the reward gifted to them for being good and faithful. Let's turn to the book of Matthew, if you would, chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Let's begin reading at verse number 21. Matthew 25, 21. Here it is. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents, and behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Going over to the book of Luke, chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and verse number 17. The Bible says, And he said unto him, Well done, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little. Have thou authority over ten cities. Faithfulness, as I've said over for the last several years here and Probably in all of my preaching times in different places, I believe this is the one thing that 
we as a people of God have the option of doing in the end that will bring the greatest of rewards, faithfulness. Understanding, of course, that we don't serve God just for the reward, but we serve God because we love him. But in our servitude, it's we who also know that one day there will be a reward coming to us. People say, well, how come you stay married? And how come you go to church? And how come you, you know, you do the things you do? And how come you don't do some of the things that others do? And say, well, you know my pastor, he's really mean. And, you know, my wife and everything. Oh, it's, it's really tough. No, we don't, do, we don't come up with excuses like that. We do it because we love God. We do it because one day we're looking to see him face to face. We do it because of him dying for us while we were yet sinners. We do it out of love we serve him out of love it's not a whip and the crack and it's not well I have to stay married or I have to do this and and I can't do this no it's we do it because we love him now what kind of reward are we talking to that's coming to us are you ready no more sorrow no more tears along with many other rewards and it is this life of a child of God that helps us to keep us putting one foot in front of the other. The Bible said he's going to wipe away all tears. He's going to take away, there's going to be no night, it's going to be day, he's going to be the light. It's not going to be a place of dreary dismal, it's going to be a place of excitement. He's gone to prepare a place for us that where he is, we're going to be also. He's got a mansion with your name on it. There's a table at the Lamb, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and there's your placemat, and it's sitting there. And all he's doing is he's preparing it and waiting for the day that you cross that threshold into your eternity. You'll find that Peter the Apostle and the follower of Jesus is well known for his impulsive behavior. Peter was one that was first to speak. First to step out of the boat, first to jump into things without thinking. So it's no surprise that Peter also was the first to break the silence after Jesus' discussion with the rich man, the rich ruler, pardon me, in Matthew chapter 19. Let's go back to Matthew 19. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, beginning at verse number 16 and let's tarry through this ready matthew 19 16 behold one came and said unto him good master what good thing shall i do that i may have eternal life and he said unto him why callest thou me good there's none good but one that is god but if thou wilt enter into life keep the commandments he saith unto him which jesus said thou shalt do no murder thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not steal thou shalt not bear false witness honor thy father and thy mother and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself well the young man saith unto him all these things have i kept from my youth up what lack i yet jesus said unto him if thou wilt be perfect and go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me but when the young man heard that saying he went away sorrowfully for he had great possessions so the young ruler wasn't willing to give up his earthly rewards and his blessings for heavenly rewards and heaven's blessings. Now, I wonder tonight what it is heaven and all the rewards that come with it worth to you. Well, I just won't. You can't make me. I refuse and cross my arms and I'm not going do it well what happens if you miss heaven well in that case well i wish you would have said that in the first place um what is it that heaven's going to be worth to you well well there, that's a sacrifice well i know that well the bible says greater love has no man than this that a man would lay down his life for his friends and everybody likes to stop in that portion of the verse but they forget the portion that says where jesus says you're my friends if you do whatsoever i command you what's heaven really worth to you what's the rewards that are waiting for you worth you contemplate that thought for a minute in your mind and, and really think about it and say well you know i'll do everything but and maybe not this maybe not well no what's it worth what shall a man give to exchange his soul what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul
But Matthew chapter 19, carry on at verse number 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I, said, I say unto you, the rich men shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Well, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? And Jesus beheld them, and he said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Here he comes. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all, and follow thee. What shall we have therefore? Practical to the point, Peter. Putting his foot in his mouth, his question seemed so unspiritual. We have forsaken all and followed thee. <laughs> what will we have? Will we be saved? Can't you see the eyebrows of the pious rise? Can't you hear the whispers of the disapproval of the uneducated fisherman? Oh my goodness. What a mouth. How don't why would you say that? Most leaders would have instantly rebuked him. Don't worry about what you're getting, just do what I say. Other religions would have told him reward is just an illusion in the scheme of the universe. Good old fashioned grit would have asserted you do it because it's the right thing to do and it's good enough. Oh, didn't even get one amen there. And you and I would have nodded our heads in agreement after all those seem, you know, more spiritual and more unselfish. Such words seemed to be the correct answer, but those weren't the answer that Jesus had given. Jesus doesn't rebuke Peter here. He doesn't tell him to just do it. <laughs> Jesus doesn't raise his eyebrows or even shake his head or sigh heavily over Peter's short-sightedness. Rather, he does the exact opposite. For he who is the truth is always practical in the truest of ways. Jesus not only allows the question, but he answers and he affirms it. Let's carry on. Matthew chapter 19, verse number 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, <coughs> that you which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in his throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel and every one that has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life but many that are first shall be last and the last shall be first you see, when Jesus died on the cross, his sacrifice opened the door of salvation for the whosoever will. This alone is reason enough to serve him, to love him, to give our all to him. However, the scripture is full of promised rewards and for those who do and when things get rough down here on earth and when it seems like we're all alone and serving Jesus, it warms the heart to stop long enough to remember just what awaits us one day. Second Peter, would you turn with me there? Second Peter. Second Peter chapter one. Open up the word of God, that richness I told you is full of wisdom and direction and Second Peter chapter one verse number four. Here we go, church, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be the partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Wow. My bank account in heaven grows every day. The interest is compounded and growing. I just can't believe what he does, he not only blesses me here, but one day he's going to bless me when I get up there. I want to give you just a few reference scriptures. We don't really have the time to dive into them, so I'll give you the, uh, what I'm going to say, and I'll give you a scripture reference if you write it down or listen to this message on another day. <coughs> Ready? 
reading for Second Peter 1 and 4, what does that mean? It means those who endure temptations will receive crowns, James 1 and 12. Those who persevere will be clothed in white, Revelation 3 and 5. Those who suffer will reign with him in 2 Timothy 2.12. Those who are faithful in the little, they have been given and will rule cities, Luke 19.17. The meek shall inherit the earth, that's Matthew 5.5. 5. The persecuted shall receive the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5 and 10. His children are heirs of God, joint, joint heirs, pardon me, with Christ, joint heirs with him who will inherit all things, Romans 8 and 17. Now, what am I saying tonight? What am I saying? See, your work will be rewarded. You're appreciated in each kind word, every patient deed, every small service, every long year of labor. God sees it, church. He remembers it, and God is faithful to reward it. So Peter, to let Peter's question be a reminder and a motivator, every little action, hear me now, has value and has worth. So use your time wisely. Glorify God every moment that you can. Take advantage of every breath that you have. Leave all and surrender all. Give it all up. And follow Jesus because you can't take it with you. You know, there's nothing in this world you can take with you. You can have the savings in the world. You can have all the possessions. And when you die, friend, they stay behind and you're gone. For it is Jesus who is preparing a place for us. He, he built it from gold and precious stones refined through the fires of our trials. And yet in the end, all of our crowns that we earn will cast down before the throne before him the only one who deserves them will crown him king and lord of all will fall before him crying thou art worthy o lord to receive glory and honor and power so perhaps that that's the best way to view our rewards love and serve god every moment that you can well you're here so you can give him all the praise through every moment of eternity the Bible says there's going to be 30 minutes of silence in heaven. And after that, you've got to get in. You've got to get on. You can't better get with it. You just might done get runned over. Now, what does the Apostle Paul write in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Why don't we go there? 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All the way to the end, towards the end, verse 58. The Apostle Paul writes this, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why am I doing this? Why bother? What's in it for me? Listen, <laughs> Peter, put your lips together and read the Bible. What's in it for you? Streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates of pearl, a dinner. And eternity with Jesus Christ. Tonight in the, this assembly, there are those who are faithful, those who have sacrificed, those who have fallen down and got up again. And you know what? They kept on going. They kept on coming. They came against the odds. And, you know, I thank God for you tonight. Why? Because you're the faithful. If you've lived for God for any number of years at all, then surely it is you who has resisted temptation, who has told the devil, no. And you're here tonight because you understand that <coughs> you're learning that faithfulness above all is one of the virtues that is most pleasing to God. See, Sister Peaver and Brother Peaver, they came to Williams Lake several years ago to start this church, and I thank God for their faithfulness. I just felt the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Sister Peaver and Brother Wilson, they picked up Sister the baton, Peaver. and they continued running the race, so they pastored this church for many years past the Peavers. And I thank God for their faithfulness. Amen. And tonight, 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 it is Sister Wilson's birthday. 
having lived all of her life for God by being faithful. I pastored her now coming on 25 years and she's never given me an account to say that she has not been faithful. So we want to honor you tonight, Sister Wilson. And we want to wish you the happiest birthdays of all. And we can do that tonight and we can share on a Wednesday night and, and say how much we appreciate you and love you and, and thank you for all the work that you've done in the church and all the years that you've lived for God, 70 of them to be exact. And, and everything that you've done, you figure, well, it's been for naught and I've had a lot of tough times and I've had a lot of hard times. But you know what? There's a crown waiting for you. There's a time when you can hear the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant enter into the joy of the Lord. Would you stand with me tonight? And the Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due. And I look across and around this room tonight. You know what I look forward to? I look forward to the time that each one of us, maybe, well, we rise to meet him in the air. Some might go before us, but we'll high five it and say, we made it. We, we made it all the way. He that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. I'm so thankful that I didn't go off left or right. I kept my hand to the plow. I didn't look back. I counted all for loss. That's what Paul said. He said, I counted all dumb, not worth nothing, but what I do for Jesus Christ. And so, I want us to pray, and, and again, Sister Wilson, we thank you very, very much. God bless you, Brother Mike. We thank everybody tonight for being here, and you know what? In heaven, there's going to be reward. Be faithful. If everything else, be faithful. Be faithful to God in everything that you do, and you will never, ever regret it. Let's pray as she sings Jesus tonight. I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to the time we're going to see him face to face. Life's trials God, that will seem so small. You're going to pour out your spirit in such a mighty way.